Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to today's Revolutionize Your Retirement interview series with experts. I'm Dorian Mincer, your host and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. So let me introduce Helen now. Helen Dennis is a wonderful woman. I have to start with that. <laughs> and she's somebody who I met a number of years ago through the positive aging movement. And she is a nationally recognized leader on issues of aging, employment, and retirement. She's been the recipient of numerous awards for her teaching at the Davis School at USC, UC, USC's Andrus Gerontology Center and for her contributions to the field of aging, the community, and literally literary arts. She's the editor of two books, author of over 50 articles, a frequent speaker, and weekly columnist on successful aging for the Los Angeles Newspaper Group, which reaches 1.3 million readers. And she has assisted over 10,000 employees to prepare for the non-financial aspects of their retirement. In her volunteer life, Helen has served as president of five nonprofit organizations and continues to serve on several boards. She's fully engaged in the field of aging. She was a delegate in 2005 to the White House Conference on Aging, and she's had extensive experience with the media. She's co-author of the Los Angeles Times bestseller, Project Renewment, The First Retirement Model for Career Women. And today she's going to be talking about some game changers in the area of age and retirement. So I am so delighted, Helen, that you've been able to work it out with your schedule to be here with us today. And I thought it would be great. You really are a pioneer in this field of positive aging. And I, maybe we could just start out with you just talking a little of what got you so interested in this area and has motivated you to really be as I said, one of the pioneers and one of the great thought leaders in this whole movement. Thanks, Dory, and good morning and good afternoon to whomever and wherever you are who who's joining us for the call today. My, my work in the field of aging goes back to the mid-70s when people thought gerontology was a skin disease, something like dermatology. <laughs> it was not a very popular field, and I think to make, not to go through a long story, but I think I had two experiences that said to me, I think this is a field I want to co concentrate on. One was simply looking for a master's thesis topic and wandering into a library, a university library, and picking up a book called Cognition and Aging. Never crossed my mind that cognition and aging, that there should be something to write about. And at the same time, my father-in-law was terminally ill with cancer and was in a skilled nursing facility, and I spent a lot of time there, although my area is not in healthcare. Those two personal and, if you will, kind of academic experiences said, this is an intriguing field, and I want to know more about it. And that kind of led my interest and particularly moved on to do a topic that de dealt with aging for my thesis. And kind of one thing led to another. And here we are, what, 35 or 40 years later, and still talking about aging. <laughs> <laughs> it is so interesting how it, it does often for many of us seem to be a combination of kind of the personal and the professional or the intellectual stimulation that's part of that. So what's new in the field of aging over these 35, 40 years, as you've mentioned, that sort of captures you now and today? So many things are new, and I would say that this field is as exciting, if not even more exciting, than it was 30 and 40 years ago. I'd like to focus on some very specific areas, but I think the overall umbrella for me in terms of what's new, and this is outside the laboratory and the important research that's being done, is that we really are moving into a new life stage. It's maybe between the ages of maybe 60 and 80 because of longevity, more resources, and higher expectations that we are in a life stage now that is very different from anything that's been in the past. In fact, we can move here to the next slide. I like to think of these changes, I like to think of these changes as game changers, meaning this is redefining, in a sense, how people experience aging and how they experience retirement. 
So for our conversation, for our little less than an hour conversation today, I just I would like to focus just in four areas, and I'm sure there are 400 that we could talk about. And let me just talk about quickly what those four are just for our conversation. One is the whole topic of aging in place. And we know 85 to 90% of people say, I'd like to stay in my own home as long as possible. And that leads us to talk about the village movement. So the second one is comment when people say, I'm retired, but there's got to be more. And that's got to be more, for me, translates very much into what the Encore.org movement is doing. And so the second topic I want to talk about is Encore and Encore.org. And three, we certainly can't deny this, given the nature of our conversation, is that is technology. And the whole idea that technology and aging are so intertwined that we can almost say technology is my friend today. And the fourth area deals with career women and the whole notion that we have more career women than ever before who are facing what traditionally is called retirement or the next chapter in life. And so what does that mean and what has happened as a result of these millions of women who have been passionate about their work that are now moving to that next chapter in life? So those are the four areas, Dory. I'm sure there are 400, but for our conversation, they're the four that I'd like to talk about. Great. And I know that we've already talked a little and that when you're talking about career women, you're also going to be talking a little about men. So I want men on the call to also know yes. that it will be a little bit of focus on both career women and what's similar and different for men. But you mentioned this, I totally agree with this kind of new life stage. And we still all use that term retirement, but it doesn't work anymore because the whole concept has changed. And so I wonder if you talk some about what should we call it? What are some of the names? What one's with you? That's a real conundrum. And people have been saying for years, we have to get rid of the word retirement. Well, we can't get rid of the word. But I think there's some alternatives that come up. In fact, there's tremendous confusion on what should we call this particular stage of life. And I want to share with you what a couple of people have tried to do in, in naming this new period. But I also want to mention Mary Catherine Bateson, who is a cultural anthropologist, I think said it so well. She says, we haven't really added 20 years to the end of life. What we've done is we've added 20 years to the middle of life. And that's the period of time we're talking about. So here are some names that people have tried to identify with this new life stage. We have Eric Erickson, who years ago called it generativity. Laura Carstensen, who heads up the Stanford Longevity Center, calls it Act 4. Ken Dykewald, for years, has been talking about middle lessons, somewhat like a late adolescence. And Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, a Harvard sociologist, says it's the third chapter. And of course, the French, for decades, have called this la troisième âge. Uh, Abigail Trafford, who many of you may know, who wrote for the Washington Post, called it the bonus years. And Boston College identifies with your title, with your title, Dory, calling it X revolution. So we don't know what to call it. And I think sometimes the uncertainty also gives us great opportunity for creativity. So I am sure we will continue to be creative to figure out what to call this period of time. And you actually coined a term that you use for your book, which was renewment. You know, exactly. Idea of um, retirement, and renewment, and this came out of des desperation, <laughs> right. saying, what do we call this time? <laughs> and renewment is a combination of retirement and renewal. And implicit, mm -hmm. it is a new time to re renew and explore and create. <clears throat> Yeah, I really like that. I like middle essence, too, although it's never really caught on. But It's never you know, really caught on, but when people talk about it, they get a sense of what it means. And there are so, the parallels to adolescence, too. Which is, there are. Asking some of the same questions. Who am I? What is my role in life? Right. Where do I fit? Some of the similar ones. Yeah. I guess we'll be struggling for a while with the name, since one of the <clears throat> game changers you mentioned is aging in place, and I know you've got some slides and have been very inspired, as I think many of us have been, with Beacon Hill Village. So maybe, can you tell us about the, what's involved in aging in place and strategies of helping people do that? Well, and so one of them is this growing movement of, of the village movement. And as you mentioned, Dory, that did start in Beacon Hill in 2001. We had a number of older adults in this fairly affluent community, three-story houses, who didn't want to give up their afternoon sherry or their trip to the symphony because they couldn't drive. And so they really decided they wanted to have something in place to help each other. 
and they created the whole village concept, which is a concept that allows people to remain in their homes as long as possible and stay connected to their community. So a lot of people say, oh, that sounds like the construction site. Is Marriott involved? Yeah. It's not a building, and as many, it's a geographic area, a geographic area. And it reminds me a little bit of the 1950s when everybody knew each other, looked after each other, but we don't have that anymore. So we have this village concept. It is essentially a nonprofit membership organization. It typically has an executive director, and here is the really unique part of it. People who are members of the village and you pay a fee, a yearly fee, have two very important roles. One is they can receive services, and I'll talk a little later about the services. The other thing is they can also volunteer, but it's not a quid pro quo. You don't have to volunteer, but it's really a give and take. And I think not only the services part, but this whole notion of being part of your community, being able to go to your book group, getting a ride either to the doctor or your fitness center, being able to go to your your church or your synagogue, to really be part, to attend political rallies, to be part of a community. And if you stay in your community, you typically can do that. So let me tell you a little bit about the kinds of tasks that often are asked for and provided by village members. Sometimes it's a home task. It's changing a light bulb. At 88, I'm not sure I want to get up on a ladder and change a light bulb. Or maybe it's taking out a heavy trash can, and maybe you don't have the strength or the balance to do that. Or maybe there's a computer glitch, and there's a computer whiz person who comes out of aerospace industry who would love to help you fix your, do, help you with your computer. There are also arts and cultural activities. Uh, I know here the Pasadena Seniors, the Pasadena Village has lots of tours of museums and they go to the symphony and they have eating groups where another group may have an older population or in greater need of transportation. Sometimes it's a home visit, sometimes it's errands. But some villages also have home services which are vetted, sometimes discounted. You need a plumber, you need someone to fix your roof. You might have somewhere to turn at some entity that's going to recommend. And usually there's an executive director that coordinates all of this. What's also very interesting is this is not a cookie cutter operation. Uh, There's a saying, if you see one village, you've seen one village because it reflects the people in that community. So it's very hard. It's not a cookie cutter operation, as I mentioned. But let me go to those who have slides, to the next slide, where there's an example of a village member who was part of the San Francisco village. And it is this whole notion to give and to receive. And I love what she says. She says, to give, to receive, to live passionately and mindfully, independently, and in the community. But the other thing is people have fun. People do have fun in the village. And this is a couple who said, it's not just about occasional helping hand. We've made new friends, volunteered to help others, and we're really having fun in the process. So it's being connected. It's avoiding social isolation. It's keeping dig- keeping independence to the extent possible. But I should add, particularly on these home tasks, it's not a hands-on. It's not bathing. It's not dressing. It is the non-hands-on things that people need just to stay independent as long as they can. So that's a little bit about, let me add one more thing. If any of our callers are interested in the village, there's a fabulous website called Village to Village Network. You can learn a great deal about about how to start a village, what it's about. And in fact, they're having a an annual meeting in Seattle. And I love the mm-hmm. title of the meeting. It's called The Village Movement, Aging's New Frontier. And I do believe that's true. So that's a little bit about the village. Should we move on to another one, Dory? Yeah, let me just mention the website, although people will see it when they get the slides, but the website is www.vtv network.org so village to village network.org and the, the part that I, I get it's amazing when i keep hearing in different communities that people have started the village so it's really getting replicated around the country i don't know if it's reached other around the globe yet but it's certainly i do you have any sense of how many communities have it now yeah um, actually yes there are 150 operational mm-hmm. villages with 50 more in development And in my community, within an eight-mile area, we have one operational village and two in the process of operating. 
it's in an eight mile area. <laughs> maybe we have a lot of older adults, maybe that's part of it. But we have it is California there's a large number in California and also a large number in the East Coast, New York, Massachusetts. I'm not sure it hit the Midwest quite Midwest quite as strongly, but I think it's just a matter of time. Hmm. And I think we'll see it where we have large numbers of midlife and older adults who are trying to hmm. plan for their future. I have a question I will integrate now because it relates to this from Bill from Cambridge. And he says he had a question about some of these village options. And he says some existing villages are quite expensive, especially for seniors on fixed income. Are there places where seniors from the same area can choose from competing villages? Or is the movement too new for that? I think you can choose from competing villages, but many villages offer scholarships. I haven't come across anything that says someone has been turned down because of the economics. Mm -hmm. Typically, there are within the budget some scholarships that are awarded. Oh, I think helpful. the average for the average for the individual is about five seventy five. And mm -hmm. I think the the Beacon Hill Village I think is something like five eighty five and nine seventy five. But it varies. Mm -hmm. And I would think if anyone has a financial issue, speak to the person in charge and I, I would really bet that there would be some reduction in fee. But certainly shopping around never know. hurts. Yep. Comparing yep. never hurts. No, that Helpful to know. Also, just one other quick comment that Elizabeth from Maryland said. What she just said that Mary Catherine Bateson calls it second adulthood or adulthood too. So she just wanted to give credit to Mary Catherine Bateson for that name that you had said before. So um, okay, perfect. Given a quote of hers. So yeah. Yes, <laughs> so yeah. Thank what, you. Tell us about encore careers. What's more? So what's more? I think this. One moment here. We'll get to this. I think this answers the question when we have people who go through a traditional retirement. They've had a great career, wonderful family, terrific community, and they say, okay, now what? I'm looking at 20 to 30 years ahead of me. What next? And so what has evolved a number of years ago was an organization called Encore.org, which my guess is most of our callers are well acquainted with. And if we had to find descriptors, what is an Encore career per se? It is work, but it's a little different kind of work. It's work that captures a person's purpose, their passion, for some a paycheck. And here is the unique piece. It's for the greater good. It's a real give back. It's a way to capture what is called Encore talent and really apply it to some of the complex social problems we have in our society, and we certainly have a number of them. So that is Encore.org. It is established in Northern California by Mark Friedman and has evolved into a movement. In fact, the language, and it's a language that I'm using, instead of retirement, I often say it's an encore period of life. And somehow it emphasizes the upside of aging. It's the opportunity side of aging. And my experience is people really relate to the term because it's hopeful. It's optimistic. And I think that's, it's realistic. And I think optimistic too. Let's see one moment here. I want to check if we have the slide on for Mark Friedman. Are we getting that slide? I want to make sure that we do. All right, Mark Friedman. Event page here, so do you have it? Just want to make sure that it came through. Yeah, Helen, it's there. Great, thank okay. you. Mark Friedman is the founder and CEO of Encore.org, and he said it so well, and I'm quoting him. He says, we're a movement of millions of people who are using our passion, skill, and decades of experience to make a difference in our communities and the world. And if we think of it another way, the talent and skills of our older population is the most under-exercised natural resource that we have in our country. And I think the real challenge is, what is the pathway? How do we connect this rich resource with the opportunities in our community as, as well as the need? And let me jump forward to just another part of the Encore movement. And that's called the Encore Network. So now there are about 50 nonprofit organizations in 27 states that subscribe to this Encore concept as in, in terms of connecting Encore talent with opportunities both in the nonprofit and government sectors. There are also some of these nonprofits that work with individuals to say, what's next? And Dory, I think your work very much, very much does that in your consulting. But we have nonprofits such as RSVP and SCORE and Reserve, Encore Hartford, the Experience Corps. They're over 50 and they are like-minded in their 
philosophical approach, their practical approach on what we do and how we can capture this talent and apply it to good social causes. So that's another part. I'm going to go on a little bit more about Encore because there are so many significant components of it. Encore.org also has what they call fellowships. Uh, and I hope that my my colleagues online will tell me if the slide comes through or doesn't if it doesn't come through. So next we have Encore Fellowships. Encore Fellowships are really for professionals, usually in the private sector, to move into the nonprofit sector in roles which they call have high social impact, ones that really make a difference, have a social purpose. And this again is growing as a move. In 2009, there were about 10 fellows in Silicon Valley. In 2014, there were 250 fellows in 35 different metropolitan areas. And I want to give you an example. And usually they work for about a 1,000 hours, and they do get paid. I want to give you just an example of one Concord fellow. His name is Massimo Prati. He was the vice president of and general manager of Cisco Systems. He moved to be the director of operations for a nonprofit called Embrace. Embrace makes portable incubators or infant warmers for populations that can't afford incubators. And so this organization has saved thousands of lives of babies who couldn't warm up by themselves and are using these portable incubators. And Prati is the, is the director of that program. So some of the transitions are not as huge as that, but the whole idea of how nonprofits can use the skills and talents of midlife and later adults who are moving out of the private sector. So we have Encore Fellowships, which is quite exciting. And let me just add one more. And this is a bit of a newer part of the Encore movement. And that is Encore U, standing more or less by Encore University. And what Encore is doing here is they're challenging higher education to look at the older population to develop some academic offerings for people in their late career who are moving what they call to their second or third acts, okay? And again, it's harnessing these talents and saying, higher ed, get on the boat here. We have this huge population of people willing and eager to learn and apply what they know to making the world a better place. Higher ed, you have a role to play. In fact, Pace University actually is one of the universities has, that is offering an encore program. So again, it makes sense, and we hope that higher ed catches on pretty soon. And the last thing I want to mention, the last thing I want to mention about, let me get back here, is the Purpose Prize winners. And I'm sure that many of the people on our call have attended the conference where some of these Purpose Prize winners are, are actually awarded. And I just, I want to just highlight a couple. I find these people such an inspiration. One of my favorite stories, and I'll make it very brief, but they're great stories. Catalina Tapia, he won the prize, $100,000, I need to say. The purpose prize is for people over 60 who have done something which creates great social impact. So Catalina started something called the Bay Area Gardeners Foundation. He comes from Mexico, age 20, $6 in his pocket, and a sixth grade education. He manages to send his son to Bolt Law School at UC Berkeley, and apparently one of his proudest moments is when his son got a degree, a law degree. And across his mind, he said, why can't other low-income Latinos go to college? So he formed this foundation, mind you, $6 in his pocket, sixth grade education. He got his fellow gardeners together, money from them, money from the clients, and in two years, he raises a quarter of a million dollars. He funds 18 student scholarships who in turn do community service. And he forms this foundation. He won a $100,000 purpose prize. And then we have Kate Williams, who won a prize last year for her hands-on program. She lost her sight, moved from, and this is a Los Angeles story, she moved out of Los Angeles because we have such, did not have adequate public transportation, moved to San Francisco, got herself a job. That company went out of business. She Now she has transportation, no job. She went to the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind, and she developed an employment program for blind job seekers. Three years, she worked with 100 blind, 100 applicants. She had a 40% placement rate, which is equal to or better than most sighted agencies. And I've got to add, Charles Fletcher created something called Spirit Horse International. He was a telecom executive. He retired, asked the question many do, oh, my, what do I do now? So he volunteered for an equine therapy center for children with disabilities. 
And he said, you looked around, he said, this is more than a feel-good exercise. He said, this is a real opportunity to do something therapeutic. So he took his Social Security money, did a lot of research, scientific research, and he launched this nonprofit, The Spirit Horse. He now has, on a weekly basis in Texas, 20 instructors, 400 riders a week, and they provide these riding programs for children as well as adults with disabilities. He has impacted 5,000 individuals at this point. So he did something with his certainly administrative and executive skills, but it was combined with a passion and a purpose. And my last one, I think these are all my favorites. The last one is Richard Joyner, and I had a chance to chat with him. He's a pastor of this rural community in South Carolina. He's got 300 members in his congregation. One year, he had 32 funerals of people who were under the age of 30. And he said, something is going on here. And he found that these people who were dying, a lot of them had health-related issues, poor diet, no exercise, obesity, unemployment, living in poverty. So he created a family life center, which was an after-school and summer camp program. But what they did, they planted this garden, community garden. So the kids planted, they planned, they planted, they harvested, they sold, they involved the parents in it. Impact was profound. Health risks went down 50%. Employee ER use was down 40%. High school graduation rates went from 50 to 70%. And 21 churches adopted his model. I have to just add, in speaking with him, he had a bellowing voice. He says, one day I looked at the land and I knew I had to do something. I was inspired. So these are purpose prize. We can't all be purpose prize winners. But to me, the message from all of this is we all have something to give. We all have a talent. We all have a purpose that is even beyond ourselves. And I think what Encore is doing is creating these pathways of how do we get there, as well as preparing the nonprofit sector to say, let's look at these older adults as jewels, as gifts, and how do we engage and utilize them. So I sound like I'm proselytizing for Encore, but I think the concept, (laughs) I think I probably am, but the concept (laughs) makes such sense to me. And I think people who are involved in positive aging probably share a similar philosophy. Well, I think it's really true, and I don't think you're proselytizing it too much. I think many people on the call are part of Encore. And yes. I'm, after having been at the most recent summit and seeing the Purpose Prize winners, but also just the ideas that are there, it's it's phenomenal. And it really speaks to the opportunities as you were saying, and how it connects with positive psychology. Because in positive psychology, Marty Seligman in his book, Flourish, talks about well-being, being being connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. And this whole encore movement and the opportunities and the connecting of people provides that. Because once you're not in the work community in the way that you had been, or once you're not doing active parenting in the way you have been, there's such a tendency to get too isolated and these programs just connect you with people and help you give back. It's just so wonderful. It's so true, Dory Goose. I think the traditional concept of retirement, it's an old one, and for many, and I think this is probably an important thing for us to realize, for many people, this is not the route they want to go. Mm -hmm. There are still a large number of people that say, I really... I want to visit my grandchildren. I want to travel. I play golf. I read the newspaper. I've worked for 45 years. I'm tired. This is how I want to spend the next 20 to 30 years. And I think we need to be cautious not to pass judgment on them because this is the life they are choosing. But I think there is a growing number, an increasingly growing number that says, okay, what's next? What is my reason to get up in the morning? And I think some people need a period of time maybe to do the travel and the leisure. And then what I find, at least in my work, is some people then come back a year or so down the road and say, something's missing. Now what? Yeah. And so and it's not immediately after you lose a job for everybody or leave a job, not lose a job. But And I think also, Dory, I think what it speaks to is that this 20 to 30 year period is highly dynamic. Mm-hmm. So that period of I want to travel and I want to do all of these things, may be okay for a period of time, but there are going to be a lot of changes in that three-decade period. It's not static. So I think that also is a new piece when we talk about the retirement period. 
Yeah, and I think it speaks to the quote you gave us before from Mary Catherine Bateson, who says this, these bonus years aren't necessarily more older age, it's in the middle. And so how people use these middle years, there's such variability right away, late, you know, while you're still able. I know Jan Hively, who I know is on the call, always says, work paid or unpaid to the last breath. I, I think love that's that important quote. for some. Yeah. I love Why? that quote. It, you really hear about anyone talking about the last breath. Right. as a period of time of passion or purpose or it's a wonderful visual and I think it's a really great concept. Now before we go on I have discovered there's a little problem with the slides that they didn't advance to the encore slides Helen so you may want to okay. click on uh, it and also one person said she was having trouble getting to the slides I think those of you on the event page on the left it'll probably say handouts or slides and you probably have to click on that since I'm manning the questions I don't have all of that in front of me but I know from prior times. But again, don't worry if you don't have access to the slides right now because you're all going to get them when you get the recording and you'll be able to see them then. So here's some feedback. Um, Maybe Donna, is Donna on the line? If yeah, Donna's on the line. Don okay, Donna. Is it appear are the slides advancing now? We're at the technology is my friend slide. Okay, all right. So I think we're all right. set. Okay, we're okay, good. We're okay now. Keep right. the feedback coming if it's not working. <laughs> yeah, good. So tell us about technology. I know right now we have a little, there always are these technology glitches that we have yes, with yes. how wonderful it is that we can connect this way, but tell us what your notions are about technology. I think it's another huge game changer, the whole relationship to technology and aging. We know more and more adults are certainly tech savvy. I think you know, over half of the people 65, now well over half, are using the internet or email, and that's only increasing. And it's a huge business. The prediction was in 2020, it would be about a $20 billion business. Now experts are saying it looks like it's going to be closer to $30 billion. So we have to look at in our life stage that technology can be frustrating, but technology is our friend. Donna, did this slide come on of the cartoon? Yes. Excellent. So what I'm showing now for those who are only on audio, two midlife or older women having a cup of tea on a nice plush sofa with lots of decorations and print on the sofa. And one woman is saying to the other, it's been a typical day. I Skyped the grandkids, Twittered a new recipe, and Facebooked my daughter. I, we're going to hear more of that. We think of that lingo for the millennials, but we're going to hear, and also six-year-olds probably, but we're going to hear more of that kind of language, where it's just going to be a typical way that we communicate. So I think this is a trend that certainly is not going to stop. I am actually now showing a slide from an organization, and it gets back to our earlier conversation about language. This is a slide from an organization, a for-profit organization called AG 2.0 that was started by Katie Fike and Steve Johnson. It's a global organization that essentially accelerates innovation to really improve lives of older people, both locally as well as nationally and globally. And they hold very interesting, they do a number of things, but they hold very interesting events where they put together, let's say, people who typically would not get together. They put together older adults, they put together venture capitalists, and they then put together the innovators, the creators. And they have held over 85 events in nine countries in a period of two years. And a lot of these people who are the innovators, they're younger people. They're younger people who are looking at technology, looking at the needs of older adults, and say, one, there is a creative, innovative business opportunity. But what Aging 2.0 has done has reframed some definitions. And I want to go through a few with you just to get a sense how this is a different time. If we look at Aging 1.0, traditional, we talked about challenges facing older adults. The Aging 2.0 looks at the opportunities. 1.0 looked at health care. Now we look at health promotion and wellness and lifestyle. The older way looked at design for the old. Now we look at universal design. What's good for older adults is typically good for all adults. The 1.0 looked at mission-driven kinds of activities. Now we look for not only mission-driven, but business-driven. And a sidebar on this, years ago, people in the field, many in the field of aging, thought the private sector was the big enemy, taking advantage of these, quote, poor older people. I'm sure there are many companies that do that. But today, the private sector is the opportunity. The private sector is to be leveraged 
to really address many of the needs of older people. Jumping down to the last one, we used to talk about only governments and nonprofits as it related to the, aid, the needs of older people. Now we look for entrepreneurship. We look for mm-hmm. partnerships, both with profit and nonprofit organizations. So the whole technology and aging movement also has changed some of the traditional meaning and perspective on aging. And I think it's very, it's wonderful. They've changed it from aging 1.0 to aging 2.0. And again, that gets into language and also the meaning behind the language. That's fascinating. I hadn't thought about it that way of just the changes from, as you say, the 1.0 to 2.0. It's really interesting. Go ahead. Sorry. And it's gradual. I think there is an old story about a frog that you put in boiling water. Mm. And if you Mm -hmm. immediately put the frog in boiling water, they're going to jump out. But if you put a frog in water and you slowly turn up the temperature, they won't even know that it's getting hot. (laughs) And I think it's a little bit, these changes, Dory, I think have been very gradual. And then they've become so normative, we may even forget that that this is new. For us, normal may be we've used it the past three years. We think of the past hundred years. It is new, but it doesn't seem new because now we're using some of these new concepts in vernacular. So true, and it's so easy to just fall into taking it all for granted yeah, uh, without realizing how. Yeah. So what I thought I'd do is just share a couple of, and I'm looking at our time. I think we'll do this rather quickly. I may not share all of them. Lots of, couple, really some interesting innovation. I want to share one which is called CareLinks, and it's a national network of how you can find a care provider. If you're either looking for a job as a care provider or you're looking for a care provider, you can go to CareLinks. They're in 50 cities. You go online and they're, you put on what you're looking for and then you have pictures. Of, for example, you're looking for a care provider. You have photos of a whole lot of care providers in your geographic area, a description. They've been vetted and you can set up an interview through CareLinks. And if you hire them, they do all the administrative work. Again, they are now in 50 cities. Let me go quickly to another one. This is Lift Wear Spoon. This is a spoon that prevents tremor. There's a little gadget that goes on the spoon, and it's for people with Parkinson's or essential tremor, and it stabilizes the spoon. And the spoon can tell the difference between normal movement and a tremor. It also attaches to a fork. When you think, what does that do for a person going out to eat, want to order something, and spills the soup all the time. So it adds dignity, it adds control, it's a great invention. Another one I want to share is something called True Link. This again enhances independence, enhances dignity. It's a charge card. It's a debit card essentially, a prepaid debit card. And it can be used wherever Visa is accepted. And it can be programmed to block specific merchants, to limit ATM withdrawals, and essentially protects an older adult, perhaps with mild cognitive impairment, from being a victim of fraud. Again, it allows someone to act independently with dignity. Let me jump to the last one. Stitch. Initially, it may look like an online dating service, but it's more. It's really, it can be online dating, but it's a companion service. This is relatively new, and you can decide what kind of relationship you're looking for. You may want to go hiking with someone, to travel with someone. You're looking for a bridge game. So it emphasizes companionship, and they don't market your age. They match according to interest. Plus, they now have meetups. They do have now social activities. This is gaining lots of lots of support. In I know it's on the west. It's in San Francisco. It's moved to Los Angeles. It's in Australia. I think they've also opened up to the East Coast. Because when you talk about it, a number to a number of old adults who are either never married, widowed, or divorced. They may not say, I'm looking for marriage. I really want someone to go to the movies with. I'd like someone to maybe play bridge with. So the whole emphasis on companionship, I think, is a unique part. And I should add, and everyone lies about their age anyhow on these sites, so they eliminate (laughs) that. So that's just a little bit, just a tip of the iceberg of the kinds of innovations that are occurring that make life better for older adults. It's amazing. And as you say, it's the tip of the iceberg, but it's so important to hear about these. And it's making me realize maybe I should do a program specifically focusing on more of those things just to help all of us become aware of them. That's really interesting. Going along with the title of your program, Technology Mm -hmm. is Revolutionizing Aging. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And retirement. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there, it's not often within the traditional aging circles. And it's mm-hmm. almost like we have to go outside of them and make new connections to different kinds of disciplines. And that's where mm-hmm. a lot of the activity is going on. Yeah, no, it's really true. Yeah, Very lots true. happening. Lots happening. So I want to comment. I know there are a number of questions about Encore and some about technology. I will get to them at the end, but I want to let Helen continue through it now, and then I will integrate the other questions. So let's move on to about more career women retiring and what's happening both with career women and also with men. So I know that there's some programs for men, too. Okay, let us start with... Oh, before you start, I do want to just say that Maura says hello to oh. us. Greetings from Paris, from Maura, Katia, Fabienne, and Liette. Well, my pronunciation people, but I just, this can be talking a little about the Paris connection, Helen. We have to talk <laughs> about Paris, but a special <laughs> hello to the Parisian <laughs> renewment women who are not, a, are <laughs> just fabulous. And thank you for being on the call. And I hope you have a nice dinner afterwards. I'm sorry I can't join you. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about career women retiring. Why are we even talking about this now? We have obviously more and more millions of career women who are facing retirement. And it's a cohort that is really the first to live before and after the women's movement. So they know traditional female roles and they also know the more contemporary role. It's also the first and largest generation to define themselves by their work. The interesting piece here is we don't have role models because this has never happened before. And you can say we have male role models. Yes, but they are male role models, often based on a financial base. And also women have gotten to their careers through slightly different channels than men. So I want to talk about a mini movement, if you will, called Renewment. Renewment, and I'll give you a little bit of the backstory. Renewment started, first of all, Renewment is, Project Renewment is a forum, it's a process and a book. But I want to give you a little bit on the backstory. I'll go back to 1999. I got a call from my good colleague and friend, Bernice Bradder, who was retiring from her second executive director position and a very well put together lady, I need to tell you. And she says, Helen, has anything been done for career 99 for career women and retirement? Because I'm having a hard time. I said, to my knowledge, I don't think anything, I don't think people are talking about this. So she said, let's get together and see if there are any issues that we can, that we might might want to address. We had a four hour lunch. She said, why don't you invite some like-minded women and I'll invite some like-minded women. We'll have dinner at my house and see, is this an area to explore? That was a four hour dinner. So we continue to meet monthly to talk about issues of identity, issues of productivity, issues of time. And we met for a couple of years, and what we knew we were onto something different, and we actually transcribed our discussions for five years. We had no intention of growing. We wanted to have a forum for a conversation with like-minded women to talk about the next 20 to 30 years and how we redefine ourselves. Someone from the West Side said, gee, I hear these interesting women having these conversations. Can we join your group? We said, it's hard to join a group in the middle. We'll help you start a group. That has multiplied over the years and has grown virally to about 30 renewment groups throughout the U.S. and now one actually in Paris. And it's viral. This is not an organization. We don't have members. We don't have money. We don't have a board, although Bernice and I do some of the steering. And it has grown. And it it continues to what we call to have legs, if you will. So let me add a little bit more to this. We got a little press in the Time Magazine and the LA Times, and a woman, the editor at Scribner, saw this, who was a woman in her late 50s who had been in her career all of her life in one career, called the, the journalist and says, find me these two women. Making a long story short, they called us and said, we'd like you to write a book. But we knew there always was a book in this. We had started a book proposal and we said, oh, we can do that. So 18 months later, we sent in a manuscript and to our shock and amazement, it evolved into an LA Times bestseller. So renewment continues. What are the kinds of things that we talk about? And let me just say, typically what happens is that Women meet once a month at someone's home. Usually it's a potluck. Some people meet in a restaurant, but most in at someone's home. And they pick a topic to discuss. The goal, the criterion for success is not if you do something different, but if you're thoughtful about 
how you define and what you want to do with the next part of your life. And we've had some people do things quite differently. We had an executive director that became a photographer. We had a, a another executive that became an author. Another was a blocking on the name a gardener, a landscape architect that became an actress. So people have changed and done things quite differently. Some people have just expanded what they've done in the past, but they all move towards a more fulfilling next chapter in life. So what I want to share with you, a couple of topics that we talk about. One was the retirement decision. How do you know when is the right time? And women would discuss, what are the clues? What are the clues from the workplace? And then what are your own clues? Do you love getting up in the morning? Are you feel gratified? Or do you feel you are out of the pipeline and you're no longer invited to the organizational retreats? How do you make that decision? What kind of thought process goes into that? Another one really deals with identity. Who am I without my business card? I identify myself through the business card. Other people identify me through the business card. So how do, who am I at this life stage? Which almost gets back to Ken Dykewald's comparison to adolescence. Another one we say, okay, we are in a society where productivity counts. And sometimes how much you get paid is an indication of your value. So what does productivity mean when you no longer have performance reviews or goals that have been set for you for the next six months? What we found is that over time, women started to define productivity internally. It could be taking care of yourself and going to the gym or yoga class. It could be a volunteer commitment. It could be looking after an aging parent. But what we found, people started to define the value of their productivity internally rather than having it externally defined by others. And the last one I just want to share, and we have actually 38 different essays in the book with each one with a little line drawing. Now, what do we do about energy? Can we tell anyone at work that I am really exhausted? Can't say that. You fit into a stereotype. What happens when you feel you have a little less steam in your engine? How do we deal with that? And to what extent is it pervasive? So there are a lot that we have another one. What happened if he retires first? Okay. Another that says passion. Is it only a fruit and how do I find it? So the book is serious, but not too serious that we take it. We can smile going through this. And we hope that the essays, which are about a thousand words a piece, raise some questions, maybe some answers. And the last part of the book is a guide. If you want to launch a renewal group, it gives you a guide, a guideline how to do it. Bernice and I decided we didn't want to spend the next 20 or 30 years running around the country launching groups. We wanted to, if you will, empower, give the tools to people. If they want to do it, this is how to do it. But she and I are always available for discussions over the phone. And if we're in your city, we're happy to meet with you. Winding up here, this is the book we wrote. Let me look at my time here. And I... I, I want to add something on the cover. I think that they outsourced, Sigmund Scribner outsourced the cover. And I think someone really read the book because the butterfly is at the end of life. Okay, next After that phase, the larva, the pupa, the butterfly, you're done. But the butterfly is the most beautiful time, the most beautiful, and it's the freest time. And the other thing, I don't know if it's a coincidence that they chose this turquoise, which is the Tiffany turquoise. And that may have been serendipitous, but it may have been intentional. So that, that, that's our book. And just to finish this off, I think a piece to me that cuts across almost everything is one, the new life stage, and also the fact we have high expectations. We want to live independently. We want to exhibit and find our passions. We want to make a difference and give back. We want to be as independent, as connected as possible, and we're going to use technology. And if we're a woman in this movement, we want to make sure that the next 20 to 30 years are lived intentionally. But that does not get to your question, Dory, of what about the men? Okay, this is not a sexist a sexist presentation because men have similar concerns. My experience is they just go about it differently. And they talk about it differently, and then sometimes they don't talk at all. I want to tell you about a group called the Life Transition Group, which is here in Los Angeles. We have discovered each other. These are a group of about 25 men that meet monthly. They are all working either part-time or retired, highly effective in their work, and they would talk about retirement. They are more structured. They have speakers, a little more organized, but they talk about some of the same things, and once a year, We have what I call a love fest. Eight of their men, eight of our women get together, and we talk about a topic. 
And one of the things we found out is we actually have a lot more in common. The gender differences aren't that great. What is different is the process by which we go about addressing them. So we have this brother group, if you will, called the Life Transition Group. And as a last slide here, and I see I don't have a last slide here. Okay, here it is. One moment. I love the Charles Schultz line that says, life is a 10-speed bicycle. Most of us have gears we never use. And I think this life stage really gives us an opportunity to find those gears and to use them in new kinds of ways. And for those of you who would like to contact, have a further conversation, there is some contact information. And if you're only on the phone, this will be accessible to you in slides. So I think I have used up my time. Yeah, but we're going to do the questions now. Yes, that, please. You feel free. You said that that would be okay. This was fabulous, Helen. I just want to thank you while everybody's on the call. And just to mention, too, I've been a member. Um, we had here a, I think it's still going on, although I'm not part of it anymore, but uh, a renewment group that we put together through the Life Planning Network here in the Boston area, which which has been wonderful. And a number of people have asked about your book, Helen. And yes, it's available on Amazon. And the guide in the back really helps you in being able to establish one. And one person who from Barcelona, let me just find her, Mercedes from Barcelona said she wants to start a renewment group. She was wondering how to get some of these things going globally and said she wants to start a renewment group. Let me let me just integrate some of these questions if it's all right with you. Let's see. Joe from Edmonton says, do you think that the 50 plus entrepreneur movement is leading the Encore movement? The purpose prize is given to people at the top. What about the rest of them? He says, what about the rest of us, including me, i.e. the people, I guess, between 50 and 60? Entrepreneurship is, is getting a lot more attention. In fact, the Kaufman Foundation documents that there are more entrepreneurs, I think, I, something like between 50 and 64 than they are between, than they are among younger age. So there are more midlife and older people who are becoming entrepreneurs. So there's entrepreneurship for social causes and there's the other kind of entrepreneurship. So I, I think the entrepreneurial spirit, if you will, is a big mover, is a big driver. What can I do that contributes, that either is with someone else or what can I create? So I think entrepreneur, the mentality of entrepreneurship, the can do, the creative piece, I think is a big driver. Great. Another question about the Encore Network. Bill from Cambridge says, does the Encore Network or Purpose Prize group sponsor any local or national idea competitions? If not, he says the under 30 competition Forbes is sponsoring might help launch some of these new ideas. Don't know if that's something you're aware of. I don't know, but, but yeah. I would recommend mm -hmm. contacting Encore.org and asking that question if they're local uh -huh. competitions. And here's where the Encore, and if not, sponsor one. Or uh -huh. say to Encore.org, yeah. you know what, I'd like to lead the movement of having local competitions. And I think this mm -hmm. is where that entrepreneur spirit comes yeah. in. Yeah. And if the it's not there, do it. Possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And that's your <laughs> theme, endless possibilities, right? Yeah, endless possibilities, absolutely. Karen from Minnesota says it's been her experience that it takes one or maybe even two years for people to unwind from the intensity of full time careers and then they're more willing to explore options for themselves. Which I think ties into sort of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very true. I think people need a decompression time. In fact, Many counselors would suggest take some time, don't make any big decisions for whatever, six months, eight months, but take yeah. a look around what's important to you. But it's sometimes very hard because you are on a motor, you're on a treadmill, busy, busy. So busy is good, but you have to be busy about things that are important to you. And you know what we haven't talked about and it is really yeah. people from the low income. You know, we're talking mm -hmm. about individuals who have choices and have options. And I think it's really important to acknowledge there's a segment of population that's trying to survive. And not everyone not everyone has, has these options. Uh, but you can't be everything to everyone. But I think that's a population that somehow, in some way, it would be good to reach in some meaningful way. 
I absolutely agree. I keep hoping that some of these presentations might, I mean, since I have them open to anybody and everybody, I keep saying, please spread the word. And I'm hoping to bring you and other experts to everybody. I don't, I don't always know who's on the call and if it's reaching more people, yes. but I think you're right that it's an area that often gets overlooked. Indeed. So Mary from California says, any thoughts on how to engage men into new beginnings rather than looking for more of what they did in their careers, gaming on the web or doing nothing? I know women who are concerned about how they can motivate their husbands into new beginnings. That is a difficult question. <laughs> and I think what's what is I think probably the biggest challenge is to have them want to do something different, to be open to think a little differently. I don't have a pat answer. I think it's probably a process. I think there are a lot of conversations. I think some, if the husband can be introduced to people who are doing interesting things, being invited to organizations that could be social, where people are doing some things that might be also of interest to the individual. And then there is some counseling or some coaching. But I think what that question gets to is the motivation. So what if the person says, I'm really happy where I am. I, I'm really, I'm just okay. Maybe talking about an issue of how do you keep the compatibility. She is a go-getter. And he says, I'm really fine just the way things are. I think that that requires some perhaps counseled conversations. Mm. Because it, you can have the best financial plan in the world. And you can have your health. But this gets to something that is just, again, cross cutting that once work stops and people have different tracks that they're on, how do we integrate that so that those relationships mm -hmm. become can continue to grow and be sustained? Mm -hmm. But I think it's a hard one. I don't have a pat answer mm -hmm. for it. I think introducing an individual to all the options, all the opportunities, but keeping it very low key. And sometimes these things happen within a social context as opposed to a structured one. So be aware of opportunities, be aware of social relationships, and perhaps very subtly introduce new opportunities. It may be a fundraiser for an arts foundation, or it may be a score. So I would say it takes some thought, it takes some honest conversations, and perhaps a little coaching on the side. What do you think, Dory? A little coaching on the side? I think, I think that's very good advice. <laughs> I think coaching, I think open yourself to opportunities and potentials. Often getting people, couples together or men together, encouraging, talking over like a potluck dinner. I guess there could be a, a, a kind of a renewment group that's couples. <laughs> Absolutely. I think so you much know? comes um, out. I think the yeah. groups are so powerful. One, they're not pressured, but they're free to really talk about things and I'm right. a great proponent just have conversations have conference right. talk and listen yeah. participate connect things happen yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know with the focus groups that we did in preparation for the book that Roberta and I co-authored, people came to the focus groups and said, we never had talked about any of these issues with each other and how it just helps you not feel alone. So I really do encourage yeah, And you feel okay with it. Someone else is yeah, thinking about the same exactly. thing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really important. Joan from Alexandria says, are there any resources for folks who need help with technology? My older boyfriend needs help. Any thoughts on... On, on I'm sure home. there are. Yeah. I would go to your, you could go to your high schools <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and ask if there's a tech person, a student, probably mm -hmm. 15, who would like to earn a little bit money as a technology coach, give the person a title. I also think if you would go to a Best Buy or any of your tech stores mm -hmm. and ask if there's someone who does a little coaching. I also think if you go to the internet, and take, take a look and say, who's coaching in technology and do some research. I think that the real key question is, and I think this is so important to realize, one, I need to learn more, and two, I'm willing to find someone to teach me. And yes, I may be 74 years old but or 55 years old, but I need someone to teach me and to say, yes, I am willing to do that. So I think they've done 50% right. of the work. And saying, I want to find someone, but I'm sure you can find one either. You could go through adult education programs. Look at your adult ed programs in your community. Oh, yeah. I'm sure adult ed, but also yeah, lifelong learning programs also. Do lifelong learning programs. programs, absolutely. Yeah. There's an awful lot out there. Right. So just put a different lens on. 
You can do it formally or informally. And the last question here, many people, and then I'll give you some of the comments, but Don from Canada says, what efforts have been made to connect the initiatives Helen describes with the broader social entrepreneurship? entrepreneurship movement if there have been could you offer an example or two if not why do you suppose those links haven't been made yet I think you alluded to that a little bit before but I think the the Encore movement certainly taps the social entrepreneurship but if the question is why has not entrepreneurship per se and I'll rephrase part um, of the question. I'm missing something here. Okay. What, what efforts, if any, have been made to connect the initiatives that you've described with the broader social entrepreneurship movement? I think some of the initiatives have been described. If we talk about a network, uh, we talk about courses, we talk about higher ed, we talk about publicity for things like Purpose Prize. I think it's in process. And I think the reason it's hard is that we think a bit still in silo thinking without looking at inter- interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary kinds of efforts. I think in any organization, if we can get speakers that are not typical of that organization to bring in new views, new disciplines, new ways of thinking that helps connect. But I think it's in process. I think we just have to do more of it and perhaps even more effectively. That's great. Also, somebody who didn't identify themselves said that for technology resources, contact your local council on aging or Google, just Google technology for seniors. Also, local computer firms might do some training. So, just yes. suggestions. I think um, there is a group of people that would be ready to do some training. Um, mm-hmm. And the other thing is, you may have a friend. Yes. Who's really good at it? Good point. It will give a sidebar. I met a wonderful young woman on an airplane coming back from a meeting who was great in social media. And I said, I think I need to hire you. She says, don't hire me. I'm <laughs> launching something that deals with aging, and I know nothing about aging. So we had an intergenerational mutual mentoring relationship. <laughs> so look where you can barter your services. You may know something that someone else needs to know and think about how you can exchange your knowledge and talents. Great. A few more questions, if you don't mind. Let me just integrate a couple more things. First, Karen from Minneapolis says, the RP is offering free classes for seniors in Minneapolis area in technology. So it might be good to contact your local ARP office. Judy from Maryland says, can I join an existing renewment group or must I start my own? How do I know if there's anything near Bethesda? (laughs) Okay. I think on the slides, you have my email address, Helen Den, H E L E N D E N at AOL dot com. Contact me. We will I think there there may be a group in your area. We can explore that. And if not, we can help you launch a group. We can help you do that. And Bill, who said he lost his connection for a little while, talking about technology from Cambridge, says he wonders, is there an inherent tension between the desire to live independently and age in community? Are aging boomers reinventing housing or assumptions about senior housing options? What kind of innovations are you seeing beyond the village network and the Golden Girls housemates or the boomer communes? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. I just said the, one of the assumptions is that as you get older, you downsize. We're finding that in many cases, people want more space. We have the grandchildren. He needs his office. I need my office or art studio. That having less space is not always the norm as people move from a home that they've been in a long time. But the shared housing movement, I think, certainly is gaining ground. So the question is, what are the innovations? I think we're seeing changes in retirement communities and what they're offering. You know, they have to have the technology, they may have the business centers, they may have hiking trails, far more creative outlets. So I think if we look at what were once traditional, the Dell Webs are changing, if you will. And I say it's reflecting kind of the new retiree who once perhaps not more necessarily in security, but more in terms of quality of life. And I also think the AARP websites are very rich in information. Yeah. So I would really, really mine their websites very thoroughly. There's lots of good information actually in all the topics that we covered, particularly they have a program called Life Reimagined. And I also will mention the Transition Network is a national organization for women who have 
typically who have worked and have enjoyed their work, and but they are a formal organization and also one of, of great value. Great. As pulling this together, a couple of things. One, again, this has just been wonderful. A number of people have just complimented you on your presentation, Meg, Connie, Corley, make Newhouse, Connie Corley, Mora. Mora actually says, Iceland is also fascinated by your project renewment, so you're going to need an LA, Iceland, Spain ticket. And, <laughs> and I also want to mention to Mercedes, and since part of this is a whole networking thing here too, that Mora Allen, and I can, when I hear from you with your address, I can give you Mora's connection. She and Jan Hively have co-created this Pass It On network, which links people globally so that people can learn about what's happening here or in other places around the globe and can implement things in their countries. So it may be something that would be another good contact for you. Yeah, and that's I'm, a really um, important one that we don't have to invent the wheel. Right. And I think it's a really important and really effective organization. I'm just a believer in connecting and just bringing people together and helping people expand the possibilities. And I am so delighted that finally you were with us today. And can you mention, you mentioned your web, your email address. If people want to read some of your articles, can you tell them how to access them online? Sure. If you're on Facebook, there's a Facebook page called success. It's www.facebook.com backslash successful aging community altogether. And I also post them on the Facebook Project Renewment site, which is Facebook backslash Project Renewment. But if you don't do that, you can always go to Los Angeles or LA Daily News. In print, it comes out on a Sunday, and on Monday, it's online. And if you go to LA Daily News, either Helen Dennis or click on News, they publish it pretty quickly on a Monday morning. But all of it is online and accessible, which makes for an incredible platform for public education. And I'm really appreciative to have that opportunity. I should add, I just finished my 680th column. You have to wonder how much more can you write about aging, but there's a lot to write. <laughs> yeah. Every topic you mentioned today could be gone into much more depth anywhere. <laughs> yeah, we covered the surface, but hopefully the message is it's a new time. I think your theme, Dory, it's new possibilities, but it takes a little work. <laughs> it doesn't come remotely. It takes some work, and I think it's wonderful we had a global participation with Bar <laughs> Barcelona and Paris, and we also had Canada, and I think the issues we're talking about are not strictly U.S. issues. I think any industrialized nation, if not now, then tomorrow will be facing some of the, if you will, up issues and opportunities. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Any That was final takeaway, but any other thought you'd like to just mention, Helen, before we sign off? I on? think that everyone who's on this call is a resource, and we all contribute. And I think I'd like to think of Jan Hively's quote, we can do that until our last breath, and maybe that would mm -hmm. be the hope to do it with purpose and meaning. That's a good final thought and takeaway. Thank you again so much, and thank everybody for being part of the call today. You will all get a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides, and I just so appreciate that you were part of it. So thank you all for being here, and thanks again, Helen. It was terrific. Thank you, Dory. I think you've, you're providing a great service to all of us, so thank you. Thanks. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.